What happens when two bass road warriors spend quality time talking music and life with one of their peers? Find out every Monday at 8 on Notes from an Artist. Bassist educator, author David C. Gross, and bassist and head honcho of KnowYourBassPlayer.com, Tom Semioli, trade eights with the legends of rock, jazz, funk, blues, folk, country, and more. Notes from an Artist. Revealing conversations with the legends who've created the soundtrack of our lives. Every Monday at 8 on CygnusRadio.com. And check out previous episodes on our podcast. Notes from an artist.buzzsprout.com. So we have another two-parter for you. Mr. Bob Groom, photographer to the stars, although he didn't know it at the time. Some of the most legendary photos, John Lennon to be a starting point, to work with Yoko. He's got sex pistols. He's got this. He's got that. Oh, tons <laughs> of stuff. Too much. One of Rock's foremost photographers. You know, interesting, we spoke with him about his uh, some of his peers, like Mick Rock and Richard Avedon. And unlike them, Bob Groen never worked in the studio. He was on location the whole time. And one of the things that uh, keep cropping up in our conversation with him is he had no plan. He had no plan. He just did, he, he pretty much winged everything. Like you said, took amazing pictures of John and Yoko, uh, the iconic New York City t-shirt picture with John, the Statue of Liberty picture with John. He tells us the stories behind those. Uh, his work with Ike and Tina Turner, the New York Dolls, as you mentioned, Kiss, Chuck Berry, The Clash. And one of the cool things I think he said to us is he took pictures of thousands of bands, but just a handful of them became icons. So it just shows you the expanse of his work. Well, also, if, if you recall, he was mentioning the fact that for 30 years, people said, it seems a little blurry, a little soft focus. And he goes, yes. <laughs> and now it's a style. Right. Now it's in his own style. Interesting guy, just how he came uh, up from uh, Long Island, middle class, and he went to Greenwich Village in the mid-60s and got caught up in the scene there. Rock and roll was still the wild, wild west. He got he got a pittance for his photographs, right? right. I mean, there was no, uh, this was all regional stuff. But it also, what we, I like talking about with Bob Gruen is the importance of image in rock and roll. We bring up uh, George Martin again. Uh, all you need is ears. Audiences listen to music with their eyes. And uh, those eyes were set on some of Bob Gruen's uh, photograph so this is a real rock and roll history lesson right here yeah it really is and as always new york was the key new york was the hot spot the place where it all happened and here's something else guys this is the first time we've ever done a preamble to an interview well we have not even picked one of the songs yet so <laughs> we're going to be just as excited <laughs> let's bring on bob gruen man let him tell his story yeah yeah there he is. Got I'm it, Gary. All right, Bob Gruen. We see the name Bob. Hello. And there's Bob Gruen. Hello, Bob Gruen. Hi. <laughs> well, thanks for being on our show. Look at look, David. Look how nice his background is. <laughs> yeah, I have green screens. <laughs> I do. I have a green screen for when I'm not here. <laughs> well, you've been in the right place at the right time many times, and the book is absolutely fascinating. It really well, thank uh, you. It takes you back to a time when, uh, uh, well, young people should really know about. It. I mean, David and I lived through some of it. David, you lived through it a little more than I did. It was a golden era when rock and roll was not part of the establishment. Right. That was the point in the beginning was to be anti-establishment. That was a big word back then. Uh, the establishment was fighting a war that people didn't want to be involved in. Right. And the idea was to turn on, tune in, and drop out. Basically what I did, I dropped out to live with a rock and roll band. But what I didn't know was I was actually falling in to the rest of my life and my career. Fascinating that you say throughout the book, you have no plan. You have no plan. No, I kind of take it day by day, you know, and see what happens. Because plans are just meant to change anyway. You know, uh, Malcolm McLaren explained to somebody one time, somebody was asking me, Malcolm, what was your plan? How did you you know, get started. Malcolm looked at me and we looked at each other like, plan? And Malcolm said, you know, you, you go to sleep at night and you have plans for the next day and things you think you're going to do. And you wake up in the morning and the phone rings and things change. Nowadays, of course, the phone doesn't ring, but you get an email you know, and things right. change. And you just kind of, I've always just kind of go, go with the flow and try to make the best of however the situation changes. You know, you, you've got to stay in the current and keep moving. You talk about being in the right place at the right time. You grew up in uh, Long Island, as I did and your parents were your lawyers and taught you to question everything which is right. probably the perfect uh, uh training for a rock and roll photographer well take your pictures of my family also you know you have to get six dysfunctional people looking good for a 60th of a second 
And that's basically what I did with a lot of rock and roll bands for the rest of my life. So, um, you know, but questioning everything, it's not just that parents were lawyers. I think it's the tradition of uh, the religion. Uh, you wake up in the morning and you ask questions. And so, uh, you know, when I got around to the clash and they had the slogan, question authority, I'd already been doing that for 20 years. <laughs> that was Garage Land by the Clash. This is Notes from an Artist, Sidness Radio. Com. Gravitating towards Greenwich Village, obviously, which is where people of your mindset went to. Give us an idea of the aesthetic back then. I mean, you were you were at Newport in '65. There must have been an incredible energy that uh, you know permeated the whole the whole culture back. Then. Well, it is. It was very much. Uh, you know, there was a an establishment that was you know uh, fighting a war and uh, wanting people to still be kind of the straight square culture that came out of the second world war people conforming you know the building out towns like levittown where every single house is the same uh people were meant to dress the same and comb your hair the same and then in the 60s the hippie movement started um and the folk music actually before that uh started rebelling against that uh you know wanting to grow their hair whatever length they wanted or wear whatever clothes they wanted and have whatever job they wanted but certainly you didn't want a job that would support the establishment that was fighting the war so uh, there was a whole idea of us and them and there were alternative newspapers uh and that was uh kind of a big thing but not in uh in a sense like i don't know today it just seems even more polarized than ever uh, because the us doesn't seem to to be a, a group you know back then if you saw another guy in bell bottoms and his hair was a little long you kind of gave the high sign you knew you had something in common nowadays you don't really know what you got in common with anybody that's so true you know you, you mentioned world war ii and if you think about it the period right after world war ii if you were a jack kerouac or an alan ginsburg you were even more alienated than ever and then all of a sudden you got the beat movement going on then right. you've got, what did they call them back in the day? Dungarees. You can't wear dungarees to school. I remember there were a couple of uh, clothing films that they used to play at, at schools. And you saw, this is the correct way to dress, and this is not. Many teenagers are as concerned as their parents with the public's conception of today's youth. This group is our ideal of the proper school attire and social behavior of the Hicksville Junior High students. You weren't allowed in. You had to have a shirt with a collar. T-shirt was underwear. And you didn't show a T-shirt in public. Like maybe if you were out you know, on a weekend mowing the lawn, you could wear a T-shirt. But people generally didn't go out of the house wearing a T-shirt. A T-shirt was not clothes. It was underclothes. And uh, I remember you had to have a shirt with a collar, and your hair could not touch your collar. Your hair had to be shorter than the collar. And, of course, that all changed. I mean, you know, I have younger friends, uh, younger, they have people in their 40s and 50s who went to school in blue jeans. You know, dungarees, as you say. Yeah, they weren't even called blue jeans. That was not allowed. You couldn't go to school in, in dungarees and a T-shirt. That was absolutely... You could sit home with a note for that. <laughs> you know? Right. I think the real change happened when John Kennedy was elected because he had that swooping thing down the front. His so, hair wasn't that neat. Yeah. It was yeah. kind of, it, it was much freer and much looser. And that was a big deal. Yeah. And and then you had the. In fact, he, he, he got, did his inauguration. He didn't have a top coat. I remember he just had a suit. And everybody was kind of shocked how casual he was. Yeah, things changed a lot. Uh, if you see the films, actually, it's very clear. There's a film of the Newport Folk Festival. Yeah. And yes. uh, there's a film of the Woodstock Folk Festival. If you see people in the wood, in the Newport Folk Festival walking into the festival, they all have shirts with collars, and many of the men have a have a sports jacket, like Kerouac and Ginsburg had a, a tweedy looking academic type, but still a sports jacket. A man wore a jacket and a shirt, maybe not a tie. That's how casual we were. We didn't wear ties. That was a seminal moment in rock history. Bob Dylan went electric at the 1965 Newport Folk Festival. The tune was Maggie's Farm. This is Notes from an Artist, SidnessRadio.com. You see the films of people walking into Woodstock. Everybody's just wearing a T-shirt. If they're wearing the anything. I, had, I remember, actually, I have a picture of myself. I had a shirt with a collar. <laughs> that was Joe Cocker, live at Woodstock, doing Let's Go Get Stone. This is Notes from an Artist on SidnessRadio.com. Once the Beatles came, everything was over. Everything changed. Everything changed with the Beatles. Um, people started growing their hair longer than... You know, where people heard that the Beatles, you know, were doing the psychedelic music. Everybody started smoking pot. People started taking acid. You just heard two tracks by the Beatles. The first one, I Want to Hold Your Hand, which is from the February 9th 
performance live on Ed Sullivan, and now we just listen to Strawberry Fields Forever. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. The Beatles were a great inspiration for a lot of people. They weren't necessarily the first. I mean, somebody gave them the acid. Somebody else had already done it. You know, somebody right. else, Astrid Kirshner, had gone to Paris and seen other people, young models, put their hair longer and came back and said, you should have your hair longer. But when they did it, they got the media and the whole world saw it. And uh, people thought, oh, that's cool. But movements start, for whatever reason, in several different places. And then it comes together. Because I remember, for some reason, around 1968 or whatever year it was, I felt like growing a mustache and uh and at first it was kind of funny you know first week or two you just look like you haven't shaved and my friends were saying what right. are you doing you know i said i'm growing a mustache said, why are you doing that three months after i decided to do it when i was actually growing in and it looked like a mustache all of a sudden a beetle album came out sergeant peppers and all the beetles had a mustache well within two weeks all my friends were growing mustaches <laughs> well i'll tell you tom can attest over covert i was trying to grow up and i'm still an adolescent i i, I can't it still looks like six months later that i'm growing I need a shave. Well, when, 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 we, uh, when we did the lockdown, the first month, I thought, well, I'm not going anywhere. I don't have to shave. And so, yeah, I got a COVID beard. And after about a month, it was starting to actually feel like a beard. And my wife was starting to say, uh, are you really going to keep that? Aren't you going to shave someday? <laughs> you know? and, and then, actually, I was in a meeting with people who were upstate. And it's a meeting I, I see on, well, we're doing it on Zoom for the first time. But, and it's all people I knew. And some guys have beards, some guys don't have beards. And I was looking at them. And all of a sudden, I saw myself in the middle of the picture of everybody and I thought wait a minute I'm not a beard guy well why do I look like a beard guy <laughs> so that was yeah. the end of that between that and my wife talking about it it was like all right I'm supposed to shave I'm, I'm you know 76 years old I'm not a kid <laughs> They can yeah, do I'd be surprised if Gillette lost a lot of money over the COVID time. <laughs> well, not just that. People started having this grubby look as if that's supposed to be a good look. I don't know. To me, I'm older. It looks like it looks grubby. It looks like you yeah. didn't sh- either shave or not. But people who are like, they keep a consistent five-day growth. I don't know. <laughs> Mark Weiss was shooting a band I was in, uh-huh. and I had a mustache. Uh-huh. And when the pictures came out, I started looking at it. I looked like Dirk Diggler. Oh, my God. (laughs) I was over Ian McDonald's house because I had joined his band after he left Foreigner, and I went right into his bathroom. (laughs) And it shaved the damn thing Facial hair is not for me. There you go. No, well, that was the thing. You know, I I was at Studio 54 at a party, and everybody seemed to have a mustache. It was just kind of, why am I doing this? It's not any different. And I went up to a friend of mine, and I said, do you think I should shave my mustache? And she looked straight at me and said, do you like anybody with hair on their face? And I said, well, actually, no. (laughs) (laughs) And then I was on my way home that night, and I was actually, I was wearing a pair of vinyl pants, and um, and I had the mustache, and and I stopped to buy a newspaper at 4 in the morning. There was some drunk sitting by the newsstand, and he looked at me and goes, what's those? Are those pants real? And I said, yeah, they're real. And he touched them, and he said, oh, they're plastic. And I said, yeah, they're real plastic. (laughs) And I had a button on him from David Johansson's band. It said, Funky But Sheep. Right. And the guy goes, Funky But Chick, what's that? And I said, that's what these pants are, pal. And then he goes, oh, you're one of them hippie guys. And that was it. I went home that night. I shaved the mustache. <laughs> I was oh, like, no, I'm not funny. hippie anymore. <laughs> but it's interesting how things changed fashion-wise yeah. from 60s to 70s. So 60s, we've got, what, with the different drummer, conspiracy, all these great clothes. I worked at a place called Pandemonium on the West Side. Ah, good one. Yeah, and you know, you went from bell bottoms to these skin tight things and then the vinyl and, and more leather and, and, and stuff of that. It was fashion was, was different. Fashion today is I guess in a lot of respects a copying, a, a, a mirroring of some of the stuff from the earlier. Well days. I, I, I mean, you know, my wife's a fashion designer and she started with J. Crew for a year. And she said, there's only so many ways you can design a T-shirt. Like, everybody's got a neck and two arms, and that's a T-shirt. You know, there's, like, only subtle changes you can do. You can have a different thread, a different fabric, but you can't change two arms and a neck, you know? And so uh, it's fascinating to me, actually. I've seen something that that appeals to me. I've seen it in a museum in France and here in America, too. And actually, I saw it on Crete. There was a, a fresco. And if you look at the clothes that people are wearing, it's basically the same. I mean, the guy has a tunic, a a skirt, a shirt that basically, once again, two arms and a neck. <laughs> you know? And as far as the shoes, the sandals haven't changed. I had a moment where I was in a museum with my granddaughter. She's about seven. And we were in a Metropolitan Museum of Art, and they have this 15-foot-high sculpture of a naked soldier who's got a sword in one hand and a bloody head in the other. And I hadn't meant to show that to my seven-year-old, seven-year-old granddaughter. 
uh, we accidentally went through that, that section and we came through the door and all of a sudden there's a giant statue. And I didn't really want her looking up at the crush. And so what I noticed was I said, oh my God, look at the guy's feet. Now this is a 2,000, 3,000 year old sculpture. The sandals on the sculpture were exactly the same as my granddaughter. Like the wow. design, you know, I mean, you got a foot, you got some straps, it's the same thing. But the fact that the embroidery was like a vine, like a grapevine kind of embroidery on the leather was the exact same as what she was wearing 3,000 years later. Um, so, you know, things don't change like that. And, and people re keep recycling. They change the color. They change the fabric. I mean, it went from cotton to vinyl. But nowadays, you go out to Brooklyn, you'll see every fashion that's ever been invented. That was David Bowie doing fashion. This is Notes from an Artist, Cygnus Radio. I mean, some of the kids are walking around looking like my grandmother. Other kids walk around looking like the comic books that I read as a kid. I mean, it's all unisex fashion where people have like one, you know, um, what do you call it, a spandex jumpsuit. And you don't right. know if it's a boy or a girl and it doesn't matter because it's not up to you. Who cares, you know, uh, what they wear. But fashion has always been something that's been kind of very much on my mind. Um, I've always been very aware of what I'm looking at, who I'm photographing. I never really went into the fashion business because most of those kind of photo sessions are committee events where you have an art director and a stylist and three other people from the client and I, I prefer to work on my own, just me and the artist that I'm taking the picture of. Uh, that way we have some communication. Uh, I'm looking to get that kind of communication in my picture. I'm not looking to sell a shirt. <laughs> It's a different kind of business, you know, but I am very aware of fashion and how it affects people. And, and I must say that when I was going to a job, I would dress very differently if I was going out to photograph Kiss wearing probably leather pants or going to photograph the Bay City Rollers where I'd always make sure to have some kind of tartan in my outfit. You know, um, I always like to make the act that I'm working with comfortable. Like I'm right. not kind of weirdo. I have a similar kind of outfit to whatever they have, but not to outdress them because sometimes it's a little easy to better even than the singer because they're, they're, their style level is kind of low. <laughs> that was Saturday Night by the Bay City Rollers. This is Notes from an Artist on Cygnus Radio. Com. I learned that lesson uh, auditioning for Billy Idol. Uh, ah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, Tom, you know this story, right? Yes, and I actually got a fashion uh, faux pas auditioning for Madonna, but you go with Billy Idol first. <laughs> We're both okay, bass players, so, by the way, Bob. Oh, uh -huh. So before the audition, I went to Parachute and bought all this geometric GQ kind of clothes, uh -huh. walked into the audition, everyone was in leather. I realized that I don't care if I play bass with my balls. I'm not getting this gig. <laughs> that was Billy Idol doing Dancing With Myself, which was exactly what I had to do after I left that audition. Is that the tour that Kenny Aaron's? No, Phil Fight got that one. Because I remember, you know, earlier. A real lesson in rock and roll that uh, Billy did a really successful tour. I actually did a picture on that tour. Uh, Vital Idol was the album cover I did for him that came out after that tour. But uh, Kenny, we were all really happy. They played Madison Square Garden, and Kenny had been a friend of me and a couple other guys. I knew Kenny since Dust. He's, Talk uh, about a fashionable bass player. I mean, come on. <laughs> anyway, Kenny's a great guy. And yeah, um, and know. so we were backstage congratulating him, like, oh, my God, you played Madison Square Garden. How fantastic. And he goes, I'm out of work. And we said, what? He said, this is, tonight's the last night of the tour. Tomorrow, I, I'm out of work. I'm a victim of circumstance. Uh, and that's the life of, me, of a musician. You know, you can be on tour and everything's great for three months. And then the day after, you're back well, home with cats, you know? <laughs> well, you, you mentioned in your book, uh, uh, Bob. You oh, know, wait a second. No, 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 no. Let's wait, do yeah. this Madonna thing. You're not oh, you want to hear that? Okay, my story isn't exciting. This was before she was famous. I was called. A friend of mine says, hey, this... this um, production companies looking for a bass player and the pay is pretty good it's a it's a, a per, you know a, a, you get on retainer so i thought that's great and uh, he said the only thing is you have to be six feet tall and i'm about 510 but this was 1981 and i still had my platform shoes from <laughs> the 70s so i put them put on platform shoes i do the audition david it's one of those auditions where you have to read charts i read the chart down I didn't care for the music. Nowadays, it's called grunge, but then it was just called bad music, I guess. I read the chart. Yeah. I got the gig. They said, okay, show up at the office. Well, you know, you sign your papers and your contract and everything. I made the mistake of going to the office with my Converse sneakers on. So I was back to being five foot ten again. And uh, that was it. I was fired before I even got hired. Aww. And I had a, a bouffant like uh, Bob did. I had a, a, a <laughs> an Afro, Jufro, whatever. We call it Israel. Israel, that's right, I had an Israel. That was Vogue by Madonna. 
This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. We're going to talk about the, the importance of image in rock and roll, even when it was anti-establishment. And there's a book that George Martin wrote in 1979 called All You Need Is Ears. And he says in the book, as talented as the Beatles were, and, uh, you know, and even though you know, he did mold them uh, to be a pop band, he says the Beatles were just incredible to look at. He said it was so important, their image, just the way they carried themselves. And Bob, even though rock was anti-show business, image was so very, very important. And that's what you captured that helped these stars. I don't know if it was anti-show business. It was kind of anti the past. Okay. But everybody knew they were in show business. And for myself, I think that, you know, if this is called show business, there should be a show to see. Yeah. And so I've always liked bands uh, that took the time to look different, to look special. So there was something to see, you know, um, like the New York Dolls, for instance, or Kiss or, you know, Alice. I mean, they, they have a stage persona. You go to see a show, you see a show. Uh, when grunge came out, I remember, like, I, the first time I took a picture of a grunge band, they came out to, uh, I was in an alleyway outside of an awards thing, and the guys came sauntering out. I thought it was the roadies. I was waiting for the band to show up, you know, <laughs> And actually, I did a panel one time in Austin at the South by Southwest, uh, and the yeah. idea was in, the rock, in rock and roll. And I had John Barbados and uh, D.P. Fallon and Jesse Mallon and a number of people discussing whether or not you could teach rock and roll. Like, could they buy John, you know, could John Barbados take somebody walk into a store and he says, okay, put this on and you'll look like a rock star. We all decided that you could buy whatever clothes you wanted, but that there was a charisma that you can't buy. You either have an attitude and you know how to look cool in which case you can wear just about anything or you don't <laughs> and if you don't it doesn't matter how sparkly the shirt is if you don't wear it right you don't look right and so there is a whole charisma thing that goes on to uh, get rock and roll i mean you still need a, you know a haircut and attitude <laughs> is the basic uh, basis of rock and roll image but um actually the attitude is 90 percent of it right well right. you know bill Quain said something to me when when he was managing one of my bands and he said steve stevens i told him even if he goes to the deli he has to dress like he's on stage you must dressed like that always. And yeah. it was an interesting thing because he managed me three years after I failed when he was managing Billy Idol. So I had already learned that lesson by then. <laughs> but another thing, Tom, I don't know who said this, but someone we were we were interviewing said, I can tell when he straps the bass on if he's going to be good or not. Yeah. Who was that? I don't, you know, a lot of people have said to us, I think Ron Carter said that to us, spoke with Ron Carter, I think probably Carmen Rojas. I think that's true of a lot of musicians, and you probably know it as a photographer. When you see a photographer hold up their camera, you know if they know what they're doing or not. Or just by the way they carry themselves, I guess. I, I actually got a job kind of because of that. The first time I ever, somebody ever said that. Uh, I, I was working as an assistant in this photo studio. Uh, and I left there and I went to a different studio. And that studio, uh, we actually took the pictures in the museums. for the. They used to sell slides, the transparencies at the gift counter. Nowadays, like, you can probably buy a program or something. Or I, I don't know what, a thumb drive? You can't even plug a thumb drive in anymore. But anyway, I used to make these little transparencies. Where, and what we it was, we had to take absolutely perfect pictures of paintings. Uh, and we set up some polarized lights. And setting up the lights sometimes took an hour because you had to have completely even light on the painting. Because if one side was a little dimmer than the other, then in the picture, it would look darker. Whereas if the artist hadn't actually painted it darker. So you had to have a perfectly flat, even lighting and very very technical uh so we would be set, so the first night i was working for this guy i got i got the job one morning and that night we're in the museum working all night from nine at night till three in the morning when it's dark and nobody's in the museum and i was doing everything and then you have to actually count uh, or you know with a stopwatch or something we had 45 mi seconds or a minute and a half long very long exposure so that we could have a very small lens opening and everything would be super sharp and in focus so we're counting off the long exposure and setting the lens and doing these things and about 
the second night, I think, or might have even been towards the end of the first night, my boss kind of looked at me and he said, you know, you look much more like a photographer than I do. Uh, I want you to keep taking the pictures. And the second night, after the second night, the third morning I was on the job, he quit. And I became the manager. And he was just intimidated. He just said, you look so much more like a photographer. He actually wanted to study South American history. Go figure. It was the wrong job for him, but it was the right one for me. But it had to do with, yeah, you just you have a confidence, you have a, an ability to fit into that role. And yeah, I guess it's the same thing with musicians. You, you'll see a guy play. I mean, some people like Clem Burke or uh, Jim Keltner, a couple of guys I know who are drummers, can play the fastest music. Charlie Watts, he can play theoretically very fast music without breaking a sweat. They look like they're just having a good time back there. Bing, 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 just doing everything in the right place, the right time but not flailing about, you know, and, and, uh, and, and trying to look like you're fantastic, you know, but just being fantastic which is a lot more subtle. And talking about photographers, I mean, you know, we think of photographers as some of the more pro high profile ones as Mick Rock and I guess Richard Avedon, who were uh, stars in their own right. But in your book, you talk about how you had such a very uh, unassuming persona and that's how you gained the confidence of your subjects, which was so very important because you took such candid photographs. Well, yeah, uh, Mick and I are very different. Mick works mostly in the studio, uh, whereas I work wherever people happen to be. Uh, so in my situation, going into somebody else's uh, environment, you have to be much more subtle and um, unobtrusive. Whereas <laughs> Mick, I'm strolling into the room, hello, darling, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, but it's his room, it's his studio, so he commands a presence, whereas um, I'm a visitor, usually, you know, in somebody else's space, so, uh, so I mean, Mick and I are old friends, because we don't compete, we do very different things, we're colleagues. Right, right, and then, of course, obviously, you talk about some people who just can't take bad photographs, I, I would say your work with Ike and Tina Turner, especially Tina, you know. Yeah, well, you can't really take a bad picture of Tina, she's just always fantastic. Uh, same thing with people like Debbie Harry, and in a different kind of way, Patty Smith. Uh, people who just are themselves and uh, don't really put on airs. They just uh, project themselves. Yeah. So, I mean, some people who are kind of trying to have a persona, you can catch an off moment. But other people who are just themselves, they don't have off moments. When you think about the beginnings of punk were around 75, 76, really. The photographer that comes to mind is Helmut Newton with that Bloomingdale's thing with the Doberman Pinchers. Do you remember that? Not specifically, but I do, I, I do admire Helmut Newton. Uh, he's yeah. pretty out there. Yeah, so there was a Bloomingdale's, um, I guess it was a catalog. They were grabbed up within the first 20 minutes, obviously. Mm -hmm. And there's a, this great shot of a Doberman Pinscher. They were doing a, I guess it was a shoes on a model's foot. And, you know, all hell broke loose. Oh, how could they do this? That? But it was the most amazing picture. And it really, in, in some ways, the supposed violence of it as, as we're working into punk music made, made a really interesting, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a uh, combination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I, a lot of uh, photographers, you know, do that kind of thing where they think of a concept and then create it. My work is kind of the opposite, where I find what's going on and try to capture it. Uh, I don't usually create a shot, you know, by telling somebody, why don't you do this and we'll go there and you'll turn like this and look like that. Like when I'm doing a session, I don't give me, say, give me more leg, baby. You know, I often say almost nothing. And I just wait for people to um, define their own comfort level, define the way they feel like looking at the camera. Because I always felt if I tell them what to do, then they're going to be looking like they're doing something that somebody told them to do, rather than just looking like themselves and looking at something that they thought of themselves. Uh, I mean, it's, it's rare. I mean, that's why one of the reasons I'm really proud of the picture I took of John Lennon, the Statue of Liberty, is because that was a conscious thought in, a, in advance where I said, wow, that would be a good picture if we did this. And uh, and John happened to agree with me and, and, wanted, and he said, that's a great idea. Let's go to the Statue of Liberty. So uh, in that case, we went there on purpose. That was Give Me Some Truth by John Lennon. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. Kiss with the Dress to Kill uh, came as part of a photo novella that we were making for Cream Magazine. A photo novella is kind of like a comic book made of photographs. And uh, it was two pages where Kiss um, 
finds out about a John uh, Cle- a John Denver concert, which we actually cleverly disguised by calling him John Cleveland. But they hear about this concert and they think that the world is going to, is just getting so boring and they want to save the world with rock and roll. So they put up fake posters and everybody comes to the John Cleveland concert and they come out as Kiss and they save the world and, and, uh, and they get rewarded. Uh, they get medals pinned on them and they have an orgy. Uh, for some reason, the picture that's titled Kiss Orgy is one of the most popular pictures on my website as far as, you know, a number of hits. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But when we did that with a picture that uh, as we were coming out of it, we went to a subway and they're dressed in suits and ties because in the morning when they find out about this concert, they're actually on their way to work in their secret identity. Uh, You know, like Clark Kent has a suit and tie instead of looking like Superman. Uh, In this case, they did have their kiss face as if nobody would recognize their face, you know, being kissed. Uh, but they had suits and ties. And as we came out of the subway, I said, oh, here, let's take a picture on the sidewalk, stand over by that lamppost. And then we took some pictures and we moved on. When Kiss saw the magazine with the picture of them by the lamppost, they loved it so much, they said, oh, we're going to use that for an album cover. That was Rock and Roll All Night by Kiss. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. So it wasn't even done originally for the album cover. They, they came up, looking at the picture, they came up with the title Dress to Kill. Uh, that wasn't preconceived. That was something they decided after they saw the picture. And I think right after that, they did a comic book where they allegedly said we have our real blood in the... It's not alleged. I just thought it was hilarious. No, that wasn't alleged. I was there when they poured their blood into the ink. Yes, they actually had real kiss blood. Uh, It was quite a day. Uh, Stan Lee came with us. It was really exciting for me, having been grown up on Marvel Comics, to actually meet Stan Lee on this private plane. We flew up there. In fact, on the plane, being kind of corporate shit, they had like a Playboy magazine and a couple other magazines for the execs to look at. So I'm looking at the Playboy magazine, and that month, that exact day, there was an interview in Playboy magazine with Stan Lee, and there was a picture that he had made that showed him flying across the page as Spider-Man. So I just jumped across the aisle. I said, "Hey, Stan, would you sign this?" And so I got an autograph on that picture from Stan Lee. If you ever see it on eBay, you'll know I'm broke. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I thought it was very flattering that Chuck Berry asked you for your autograph when you took that the That was shot. the first time, first time I ever signed a photo. I'll, I'll never forget the moment. You know, always having been, Chuck Berry being like God to me growing up in the 50s. And then actually meeting him, which was even more, you know, just talking to him was amazing. And then when he asked me, that, he said, I want to buy this picture from you. And he gave me a $100 bill. Uh, and then he said, I want you to autograph it. And uh, I had never signed a photo. I didn't. You know, have the concept of a photograph as art yet, really. I remember I didn't want to mess up the front of the picture, so I wrote on the back to the king of rock and roll, Chuck Berry. And I always wonder where that print is nowadays. That was Say La Vie by Chuck Berry, 1964. Let's get back to our interview with Bob Groom. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. Isn't his home a museum now in St. Louis? or that it's, probably there. It's, pro- it's probably there in his home. Yes. Actually, it's something I was very proud of. That Chuck Berry had my picture in his house, and so did Bo Diddley. Wow. Uh, right outside the door, Bo Diddley had one of my pictures. So actually, the picture in Bo Diddley's house was a picture of him and Chuck Berry. And that was Bring It to Jerome, Bo Diddley. This is Notes from an Artist, CygnusRadio.com. When I look at your pictures of John Lennon, it was it seems to me that he was very comfortable in front of the camera, and I guess that was born of your relationship because you guys were friends. But John looks very, very casual in your shots well because we were casual together yes i mean that part came about because we were friends but working with john lennon was very easy because when i met him uh, in 1971 it was the first time i ever saw him uh he had been a beatle you know since 1960 whatever and as beatles they did photo sessions every day several times a day uh it's an interesting thing if you look at pictures of the beatles they're wearing a different outfit in almost every single picture there are pictures of the beatles in every outfit from bathing suits to duck costumes. Uh, I am the walrus, you know, but there's a million different suits, ties, shirts, polka dot shirts, black shirts, you name it. There's a picture of the Beatles. They must have done because they're only together like, what, four or five years. A lot of bands have like 10 different pictures that you know about them or something. They do a picture two or three times a year. They'll do a photo session because bands need promotion and pictures. But the Beatles must have done photo sessions every day sometimes a couple of times a day, because you just see unbelievable number of pictures of them in different outfits, different places. It's like they were always having their pictures taken. I am the walrus, the Beatles. Notes from an artist, CygnusRadio.com. 
so by the time I met John 10 years later, since he had started the Beatles, he was so comfortable having his picture taken. He wanted people to, to, you know, he knew that people were interested. And so he wanted his life documented. So it was no problem to have, to have a, a photographer around all the time in the studio or in the kitchen. He just, you know, was very comfortable having his picture for different cameras. They had the SX-70 Polaroid. In fact, I remember being the first one to show him the SX-70. Uh, my mom, who was into photography, they, when the SX-70 first came out, they only sold them in the South, in Florida, and a couple of other places as a test mark uh, because of the temperature. The, the film couldn't get super cold. So uh, my mom bought me one down there in Florida. And that was the first one that John Yoko saw. And this was a time before uh, artists uh, took control of their image. You mentioned that in the right. book and how that kind of uh, changed the whole perception of rock music. I guess it, at that point it was starting to become uh, a more you know, showbiz because your, your, your pictures have a connection to the people where, you know, artists control pictures. They're kind of antiseptic. They're kind of planned. They're kind of they're too Well, programmed. it became advertising instead Yes, of that's the word, yeah. Uh, you know, when I was working, people wanted to show who they were and what they were. Uh, in the 80s, when the corporations started taking over, they much more planned. Like, we want you to look like this, and this is the photograph we want of a certain person. And by the early 80s, 83, 84, people started wearing makeup. Uh, I remember by the mid-80s, I had to get a makeup artist for a lot of our photo sessions. And there's still a number of bands like, oh, we don't do makeup. I'm like, this isn't like New York Dolls. Because it'll just take the hangover off. It'll make you look like you've been in Jamaica for three days. I had a very good makeup artist, so it didn't look like you were wearing makeup. You just looked a little healthier. And, you know. and how did MTV change the business of, of the art form that is rock photography? Well, MTV changed the dress. That was a big part of people being so much more aware of creating an image rather than just capturing an image. With so many people watching. You know, millions of people watching the image. I mean, before that, uh, you'd hear music and you were much more involved with hearing music and you could see a picture of a band. Oh, that's what Buffalo Springfield looks like. You know, there's a couple of pictures. But there was no internet that you could go and check it out all the time. It's like when you got a copy of Cream Magazine or if you picked up a copy of Rolling Stone, then you could see what a band looks like. Right. Mostly we were interested in the music. That was For What It's Worth by the Buffalo Springfield. This is Notes from an Artist. On SignusRadio.com. Yeah, after MTV, the image became so important. Mm -hmm. Everybody was looking at a band first or hearing the music while they're looking at the band. So you really had to create an image of what you looked like. I actually found it funny that uh, since there is an internet now and you can instantly see anything like that, I realized that when a doctor told me, uh, I had had a doctor appointment, he mentioned that he was in a band in college and uh, in New Jersey. And I went home and I realized that I immediately started Googling to see what the band looked like which was more interesting to me than what they sounded like you know if they were wearing purple bell bottoms and a pink tie this big i would have a better idea of what they were going to sound like before i clicked on the music but i wanted to see was he the guy with the purple bell bottoms or was he the guy who was wearing a suit and tie you know, what kind of music from their image well true my dentist is uh or was the um, keyboard player for every mother's son uh, uh, a real clean cut band that was my dentist playing keyboards with every mother's son. Come on down to my boat, baby. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I think my first recollection of any video of a band was on a loser by the Beatles on Hullabaloo. And that was just the band playing their song. Until MTV, you didn't... And so many of MTV's videos have nothing to do with the song. No, there's stories, little stories. Uh, one that I remember, um, and I forget what I forget what song it was, but there's a girl who goes down into a Fallout show, and there's a whole scene about getting stuck in a Fallout show. But the cartoon of Dire Straits, I Want My MTV, that shows the right. workers in a factory packing up refrigerators and TVs and saying, that ain't working. You know, look at those guys. Yeah, MTV changed everything. You know, video took the, killed the radio star. That was one of the first videos, and it's so totally true. That might even be the one with the four circle. Oh, okay. video killed the radio star. That was the first video. Well, the first on, on MTV, yes. That was the Buggles doing Video Killed the Radio Star. And that's an interesting band because it was Jeff Downs on keyboards, who was in Yes, and also um, Asia, and Trevor Horn, bassist, who produced everyone from Yes to Frankie Goes to Hollywood. This is Notes from an Artist on CygnusRadio.com. I mean, there were videos before that, but they were hard to see because there was no channel that you could see at home. I remember when the Ritz opened uh, in New York in like 1982. It was a big theater, and the claim to fame at the Ritz was that they had a 25-foot screen, and that mm -hmm. in between the bands, they would play rock videos. Yes, which I 
remember. becoming a new thing because there were bars that would play video. It was around 76, 77 that record companies started putting out videos of their bands, but they would put them out to bars. I know a guy, actually, I forget the name of the company, but he had a monthly service where he would send a cassette, t- uh, you know, a three quarter inch video cassette right. of new videos of the month. And he would send them out to bars that played rock video. And uh, the Ritz being the one with the biggest, brightest screen. And, and you would go there. I mean, there'd be a band every once in a while, but in between the bands with all these videos of people, some people would go, they didn't care what band it was. They wanted to see the, all the new video. Because then when MTV came out, that was um, 80, even in the early 80s, you, you still went to the Ritz because who had cable? <laughs> right, right, exactly. Cable was something you had to pay for. So it took a while for MTV to catch on. I remember thinking it was kind of funny. Uh, when MTV first came out in 1981, I believe, we couldn't get it in New York. For the first year, it wasn't available on the New York cable channels. And we were all going, I want my MTV. <laughs> right. But then uh, downtown got it faster than uptown. Because there, yeah. there was a demarcation line. I forget the name of the two competing companies. Well, Manhattan but... Cable was on 23rd Street. Right. Okay. They were the main... They were the main uh, cable but yeah they had to wire buildings that had people who could pay for cable kind of funny that as the city was getting more and more wired i started uh, i started recording bands uh, with a portable video camera 1970 i think 1970 uh, when the sony porta pack was invented i talked my dad into buying me one and i started videotaping bands actually the first one i talked about in in my book uh, where i started working with like tina turner because tina loved the fact that she could see the show with the i guess right after they did it before that the only way a band could see themselves is if somebody had the money to pay for a film which you would then have to get developed and then have a projector and a screen to show it whereas with video you could take a tape a show roll of videotape was ten dollars and that way cheaper to film and you didn't have to process or anything you tape a show and immediately go into the dressing room or the hotel and play it back on any tv and see the show so that was a huge thing for bands to be able to see it and i started taping more bands the new york dolls loved watching themselves on tv and that was the new york dolls that was trash from a rock concert with ron delsner this is notes from an artist cygnusradio.com and then I started taping more and more bands. I had a, a good connection with the owner of Tramps here in New York. And they had everybody from Willie Dixon to Tracy Nelson to Larry Coyle. And I made all these tapes. And when the cable started in, uh, around 73, 74, part of the deal with the city is that the city insisted that it wasn't just commercial. They had to open two channels for community oh, access. access. Right. It was, yes. And the public access. So you could go there and just sign up. First come, first serve. You get a half hour or an hour. So I started showing the videotapes I was making of bands. And I had a, I took two half hours and two hours a week. And I would just take random times, like one in the morning or, you know, whenever I thought rock and roll people might be sitting there stoned watching TV and then all of a sudden my show would come on. And a couple of years later, because my building, I live in a, a artist building in the West Village and it's a, you know, a, what do you call it, subsidized building. So there's not... Was it West Beth? Here in West Beth, yeah. So it's a building that basically the whole building, people don't really have much money. And uh, and they hadn't wired us up at all. Down the block where they got ta- brownstones and rich people, those people could afford it they got it but our, our block we didn't get the cable and one day i was talking to somebody at the cable company and i mentioned i was bob grew and he said oh are you the guy who has those rock and roll videos i'm like yeah i do he says, i love your show man you're showing all those you know videos from different clubs and uh because i called to ask when they could get to our neighborhood he was like oh we're not going to your neighborhood. then when he found out who i was he says you mean you can't watch your own show in your own building and i said no it's not in our building he said i'll take care of that so i got the whole uh-huh. building <laughs> because i had my tv show uh, but around 76 or so, by that time, people started owning cassette. Uh, they were three-quarter inch. They were big. VHS came out like 78 or so. But the first cassettes, people started having, and I didn't like the idea of showing my videos and people recording them. I didn't want people to have copies of my videos. So I stopped my TV show, and, and nobody had ever really talked to me. I didn't know if people were even watching me. Didn't see, it was just something I did as a hobby. But people didn't really seem you know, too involved. As soon as I stopped, I started getting calls, letters, friends talking to me like what happened to your show and i was like you watched it and, and one friend said yeah i never had to go out anymore you were showing me what was going on around town <laughs> so, but it wasn't until i stopped that people said anything to me about it, it was kind of fun i love the parts in your book where you talked that your apartment was the place to hang because you showed all these videos and and yeah, really video parties yeah, yeah your I video mean, parties we had elephant's memory labelle <laughs> and a couple of people my Katina band all in the living room at the same time mm-hmm. Turner came one time john and yoko came one time. even even though it's all available i had the, the the tape recorder was 1500 bucks, but most people didn't have a machine to play a tape so they all had to come to my house to watch it it was easier than 
film, but they still they couldn't do it at home yet. That equipment must have been expensive in those days, and it must have been bulky because right wasn't where the uh, yeah. cameras big. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I remember noticing how at one point the box that the camera came in when they had a camera that had a cassette built in that was smaller than the camera that I used. <laughs> the camera I used was about this big with the camera lenses and so on, and then there was a cable that attached it to the actual tape recorder, which was a reel-to-reel tape recorder, like the old-fashioned thing. It was a half-inch tape. We threaded it through the reels and, and you carried this thing on your shoulder. It was about 40 pounds. And then, and that would work for half an hour on the battery. So to make it last a bit longer, you wore a belt. The belt was about another 12, 15 pounds, and that would make it work for another hour. Like the belt, uh, the battery belt lasted about an hour. So you could get about an hour and a half portable to videotape. Now it was black and white. The sound was mono. The quality, it didn't really work very well at all in the low light. It was about the quality of a Polaroid. But at the time, it was a modern invention. It was a modern miracle that you could tape something and go back and immediately show it back. And, and you could afford it. A half hour was $10. Once you made the initial investment, which yes, $1,500 in 1970 was a lot, a lot of money. Somehow I convinced my dad that this was going to be, the videotape was the future and I had to be in on it. And it was a good thing. But after a while, actually by 76, as videotape really started taking off, it became a committee project. You needed to have lighting and sound and producers and and. And I, I, like I said before, I like to work alone. So between that and the fact that people were going to start copying the tapes, I just stopped making tapes. But it's fascinating to me now to see everybody's got a little stereo color recorder in their hand. <laughs> they call them telephones, out. yeah. Ugly George, boy, he was funny. He would just walk around town and confront people. He had a whole contraption on his back. Yeah. With and a spacesuit. Yeah. He was, he was, like a backpack, you know? And then, of course, the great, the great Al Goldstein. And yeah. um, and it's interesting because with the networks I remember with Manhattan Public Access, I think you paid what twenty five dollars and you got your show on. No, 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 no was it was free. It, it was, was free. free. Okay, the networks tried to co op that, but they couldn't. Uh, they couldn't approximate the DIY aesthetic of it. They just not at all. No. They couldn't do it. They no. couldn't do it. That's where Glenn, uh, Glenn O'Brien had his TV party where he would tape a su- sort of a panel on stage at the Mud Club, uh, and he had Jean Michel Basquiat and Debbie Harry and. Uh, a lot of the downtown artist people. He packaged some of them in the Glenn O'Brien's TV party you can get on, I, I guess it's streaming, everything's streaming. I was going to say a DVD, but I've seen so many advances in my life. It's kind of weird to realize that as I'm older, looking back, I remember when uh, cassette recorders were kind of came out. You know, the fact that there was a cassette, you know, eighth inch tape that, you know, worked, played stereo, man, was a new invention. And the phone, I don't know why they call it a phone. It does so much. I mean, I, you have your phone in your hand, it tells you Every, anything you ever wanted to know in the world if you remember it just ask Google you know people in their 40s they don't take calls you can text them and they'll text back and sometimes they, you know when you're texting somebody and you go two or three times you're texting and they're answering right away and I figure, the guy's got his phone around in his hand why don't I just call them and we'll have this whole conversation I have type over and over and you call and call and call and they don't answer the phone and and you text back and say, oh, I can't talk right now but you can type you know it's, it's just I don't know it's a new world to me to see all it is but it's fascinating when my granddaughter was three she's 11 now but when she was three she could sign into netflix and pick her own show and she knew exactly how to do that i found that fascinating you know well speaking of which now you we we had something similar in the, in, with music when pro tools came out and now all of a sudden everyone was a recording engineer you didn't have to go to a recording studio and then, of course, with digital distribution, now everybody became their own record label. Uh, right. So you didn't have to go stand before an A&R man or, or do a, a showcase in New York City. And it seems like the same thing now with, obviously, with the iPhone, as you say, which is really a, a camera with a phone in it. How has that affected the art of photography as you see it? Well, I think it's expanded it. I mean, I always enjoy taking pictures. And I see other people really enjoying taking pictures. They'll take a picture and immediately look at it. And in my time, there was that moment with the Polaroid. There's lots of pictures of people looking at Polaroid because once you took the Polaroid, you immediately looked at it to see what it was going to look like. And there, that's a moment that people you know, universally share, that moment of waiting for the picture to appear. And now you're not waiting for it to appear, but everybody wants to know immediately what does it look like. And I see people smiling and enjoying it. And it, that's something I always did. So I think it's good that people can take pictures, people can show pictures of what's going on. I find that the quality is so amazing. The way the algorithm reads the light last june part of the tribeca film festival there were two films that came out one from blondie and one from kiss uh, kiss has a documentary and blondie had a documentary about the 
a trip to Cuba. I got invited to both of the screenings, which were outdoors, and they played a short set, each band, after the... They were different days. Uh, and I took pictures of them. If you look at my Instagram, that picture is as good as any picture I've taken with my bigger camera. We're just listening to two tracks. The first was Kiss doing Nothing to Lose, and then One Way or Another by Blondie. So, we are done, but we are not done. What does that mean? Well, there is so much information and so much more music with this interview that we're putting this into two parts. So next week will be part two of the Bob Groon interview. I want to thank you all for listening. On behalf of co-host, head honcho for Know Your Bass Player and all-around nice guy Tom Semioli, I want to say good night, thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week. Take care. Thank you.